Well, I'm John. Uh, I'm a uh, linguist by training. Um, I had an interest in ancient languages, and I studied Akkadian and Sumerian with languages of ancient Mesopotamia. I wrote my dissertation on, on Akkadian, but I, I had a fair amount of Sumerian at the same time. Um, now, this is in the context, I gave a talk on Akkadian a couple of months ago, um, so I won't be talking a lot. I, I talked a lot the last time about the decipherment of Akkadian and, and how the writing system works. I, I won't talk about that so much today because it might be repetitious, but um, if you want me to, I can. Uh, there's, there's a lot of new people here, um, so let me know. Um, Sumerian is what linguists call a language isolate. It's a dead and forgotten language. It was spoken in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, probably from at least the fourth millennium BC up until about uh, 1800 BC. It died out in, in what people call the old Babylonian period. It has no known rel relatives um, it, it, and that made it very difficult to uh, decipher. By contrast, Akkadian, which was the neighbor of Sumerian, was also a dead forgotten language, but it showed clear and obvious similarities to Semitic languages, such as Arabic and Hebrew. And the similarities were in vocabulary and grammar. For example, the, the Akkadian word for dog is kalb, uh, kalbum, and, and the Arabic word for dog is, is kalbun, it's, it's identical. So people realized very early on what Akkadian was. Sumerian was quite different. Um, by contrast, uh, Sumerian was alone in the world. So decipherment was, was quite difficult, um, as you might imagine. Um, so uh, Sumerian is the earliest known, uh, Sumer is the earliest known civilization in the historical region of Southern Mesopotamia. And you can see that on, on the map here, it's down towards what today they call the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf. It's, Sumer was one of the cradles of civilization in the world, living along the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates uh, rivers. Sumerian farmers grew an abundance of grain and other crops, the surplus from which enabled them to farm urban settlements. These were the first cities. Well, they were more like villages in, in our sense, but they, they were the first cities in, in, in world history. And the other, the, the other major contribution is they're credited with the invention of writing. The origin of the Sumerians is not known, but the people of Sumer refer to themselves as the black-headed ones, uh, Sag Gig in Sumerian, uh, black-headed people, for example. For example, the Sumerian king Shulgi uh, from the third dynasty of war, he described himself as the king of the four quarters, the pastor of the black-headed people. The Akkadians also called the Sumerians black-headed people, uh, Thalmat Kakadi in, in Akkadian. Uh, there were many other suggestions for the origins. The Sumerians may have been a North African people who migrated from the Sahara into the Middle East and were responsible for the spread of farming in the Middle East. However, the evidence strongly suggesting that the first farmers originated from the Fertile Crescent, uh, what um, what uh, archaeologists call the hill, hilly uh, flanks, I believe. Um, the, um, a recent ge genetic analysis of four ancient Mesopotamian skeletal remains suggests an association of the Sumerian with the Indus Valley civilization. This is a very old civilization in southern Italy, we, and southern India, excuse me. We can't read uh, their inscriptions yet yet, if we ever will, so we don't know much about them. And, and in general, if you just have archeological evidence, you can't say much about culture beyond pottery. Things like languages are obviously inaccessible. Um, according, some people think they had something to do with the Horians and the Uratians, and the Caucasus is, is con some people consider the Caucasus to be the homeland of the Sumerians, but all of this is totally uh, speculative, and there isn't much supporting any of it. Now, um, now, if you look at the map, the Semitic nomads uh, and their origin is very unclear. Traditionally, they thought that they came from the Arabian Peninsula, but they ended up in northern Mesopotamia, if you can see on the, if you follow my cursor here, and Sumer is in the south. Um, in general, Akkadian, um, over time, over millennia, just supplanted 
Sumer because the Akkadians were much more successful politically. They had the first major empire in the world under Sargon, one of their most famous kings. And they supplanted Sumerian as a spoken language, but then Sumerian had a very interesting afterlife uh, as, as part of Akkadian culture. Um, now this is Gudea, the Ensi, that was the lot of a city, the Ensi of Lagash, and about the 21st century BC. The pre-Sumerians, the situation before the Sumerians got there, wherever they came from, is very murky. Since it's prehistoric, the evidence is strictly archeological, as I, as I said. There are hints of a people who preceded the Sumerians in Southern Mesopotamia. It's a, a prehistoric people who lived in the region before them, and they are termed the Proto-Euphratians after the name of the river. The Sumerians never mentioned themselves, uh, but th these people, the Proto-Euphratians are assumed by modern day scholars to have been the first civilizing force in Sumer. It's said they drained the marshes for agriculture, they developed trade, they established industries, including weaving, leatherwork, metalwork, masonry, and pottery. They were illiterate, of course, so we don't know very much about them. Um, a lot of scholars contest the idea of a Proto-Euphratian language or one substrate language. They, um, they think the Sumerian language may originally have been that of the hunting and fishing people who lived in the marshland, marshland in southern, what, what is today Iraq. And the, those marshes are famous. Saddam Hussein famously drained them in order to get rid of those people. But in antiquity, they may have been where the Sumerians uh, were uh, originally. Um, some people, however, think they lived in Eastern Arabia, uh, today's Persian Gulf region, region uh, before it was flooded at the end of the Ice Age. Now, it becomes less murky uh, in the fourth millennium BC. It took form in what's called the Uruk period. Uruk is the name of a, a city, a Sumerian city, which, by the way, Uruk may be the origin of, uh, it's, it's now called Waka, W-A-R, I'm, I'm from Boston, so I'm challenged with that our phone, phoneme. Uh, it it re retains what appears to be the same name as it did in antiquity. And it also may have something to do with the name of the country, Iraq. Uh, usually in, in Arabic, Iraq means deeply rooted, but it may have had its origin in a Sumerian name, uh, but that's, that's not certain at all. So as I said, the Sumerians progressively lost control to Semitic states from the Northwest. So imagine the, the Semitic nomads, wherever they came from, Arabia, they just moved in and they were better at fighting and they just uh, progressively dominated the uh, Sumerians uh, in the South of, of what's today Iraq. Um, but once Sumerian, um, Sumerian eventually died out people for career purpose or, or whatever, they started to speak Akkadian at a, at a very early period. And I'm sure there, there, were, there were pockets of Sumerians scattered around, uh, usually in, in language change situations, people in cities who see a career advantage or economic advantage in learning the dominant language. But what's interesting about Sumerian, it continued as a sacred language, the literate language, a literate language, um, uh, for quite a while, all, all the way down to about 200 BC. Uh, there, there was a period that people call the third dynasty of Ur around 2000, 2100, 2000 BC, where somehow Sumerian managed to reemerge as the dominant language and, and all the royal inscriptions were in Sumerian. Akkadian kind of disappeared from, from the historical record but that was only for a while, and then Akkadian reemerged. And when I say it reemerged, the only evidence we have is inscriptions and tablets. So people just looked at, you know, count the number of documents in Akkadian or Sumerian and decide what was what was the dominant language. Now, um, the Sumerian city of Eridu on the coast of the Persian Gulf is considered to have been one of the oldest cities in the world. The, the Sumerian saw, saw it as the source of their governmental authority. There's a famous tablet that says that at every do kingship descended from he heaven. It sort of sounds like the Chinese, but um, it may have been in every do. There were three separate cultures that may have fused. One, you had the, the uh, peasant proto-Euphratian farmers living in mud brick huts and practicing irrigation. 
You also had those mobile nomadic Semitic pastoralists living in black tents and following herds of sheep and goats. And you also had fisher folk right down. They lived in reed huts in the marshlands who may have been the ancestors of the Sumerians, as I said. And, and all of this is very hypothetical, but the Sumerians were real. Now, one thing that's most important is the Sumerians invented writing. Naturally enough, since Mesopotamia has lots of clay, mud, and reeds, uh, they use both for their writing. Using a reed with a sharpened end, they began incising symbols in wet clay tablets, which were then dried. They, they were either left out in the sun or they were fired in ovens. Um, the oldest Sumerian text, perhaps, perhaps even the oldest written text known to us, are the approximately 5,000 clay tablets discarded in debris in the ceremonial center of Uruk written in, in a very early form of the cuneiform script, which you, you can see in, in, in the image here. These tablets are dated around 3200 BC. Close to 90% of these early tablets are uh, administrative records, but there are also word lists that were used in the teaching of the writing system. Uh, they didn't have any grammars in, in our sense of the world, a set of rules, but they, they would have word lists which consisted of Akkadian words and their Sumerian equivalents. Um, how they effectively taught the language, I, I can't imagine, but they did. Uh, the text cannot all be precisely read. Uh, some have read that the, that the, the markings on, on the image you're looking at didn't constitute a written language. Um, it really just was an administrative document which had a picture of the thing uh, that's being counted like the sheep and the goats, and then had a, had a, had a, had a numerical indication. Um, after this very early period, the next group of texts from Ur show up in about 2800 BC. Again, these are administrative documents, very boring to read, and also wordless. Scholars concur that these texts are indeed in Sumerian because there are some phonetic indication pointing towards Sumerian. After that, more texts show up in different locations. At, at about 2500 BC, um, many cities in northern Babylonian and in Syria were using writing. There are small differences in the manner in which cuneiform was used in these places, but these are not uh, only variations within a common tradition. Moreover, sometimes before the middle of the third millennium, cuneiform had already been adapted to write Semitic languages, including Akkadian. That cultural diffusion is very important to the history of writing, uh, and it continues to this day, the order of our alphabet, A, B, C, D, goes all the way back to uh, the ancient Semites. They had this, basically the same order of the letters, but that, that's talking about alphabets, not, not cuneiform. So, so here you have two Mesopotamian individuals. The one on the left is Enkidu, that, who was a character in the famous Gilgamesh epic. And on the right, you have Sargon the Great. This was the uh, the most famous king of the first uh, Semitic dynasty uh, in history. His Akkadian name is Shavukin, uh, which uh, means the king is legitimate, uh, which suggests strongly that, that Sargon was some kind of usurper. Otherwise, why would he said he was legitimate? He was feeling touchy about that, apparently. Um, now, these are two contrasting sides. These individuals are two contrasting sides of Mesopotamian culture. With the rise of the competing Akkad, that, that was the name of the Semitic dynasty. By the way, the capital city was called Akkad, but it's never been located by archaeologists. Uh, so we, don't, we have an idea of where it was. Um, now, around when Akkad began its rise, this, the Akkadian and Sumerian languages entered into a highly symbiotic relationship. The Akkadian language is of a completely different type. As I said, it's Semitic. It became one of the official languages of Sumer, which was absorbed into the Akkadian Empire. And it joins the older language as a vehicle of, of administration and communication. Semitic had been written, Akkadian had been written in, in the north, but it was only sporadically attested in Sumer. Now some communities limited themselves exclusively to Akkadian for written communications. Others retained Sumerian for local accounts, but used the other language to communicate with the central government. So we have a, apparently a typical bilingual situation. Now, in general, over time, you can see a gradual infiltration of Akkadian into Sumerian territory, 
With the, and how do we know that? Well, there's an increasing, increasing occur, occurrence of Akkadian place names, inscriptions in one or the other language and personal names. Um, for example, Ankidu is a Sumerian name, meaning the lot of the earth is sweet, as opposed to Akkadian names such as Sharukin, that's Sargon. The king is legitimate, as I said. How do I know Enkidu is a Sumerian name? One of the nice things about research in Mesopotamia, it's easy to tell Akkadian from Sumerian. Um, it's not easy to tell the difference between two closely related languages sometimes. But in the case of Enkidu, you have Ain is the uh, word meaning Lord. Ki is the word meaning earth. Do means sweet. This is all monosyllables. Uh, this is highly characteristic of Sumerian, resembles some East Asian languages that way, like Vietnamese. Words only come in one syllable. And um, uh, I should say elements. And this is a combined title, Enkidu. Uh, it's the uh, uh, lord of the earth. And then the verbal element is do, meaning sweet, as I said. Now, how do I know Sharu Keen is an Akkadian name? The element Keen is an Akkadian word, meaning legitimate, actually means true, uh, it's basic name. It's attested in other Semitic languages to which Akkadian is related, like Arabic and Hebrew. So that, as I said, that was a big advantage in the uh, decipherment of Akkadian. We have much better understanding of Akkadian than, than we do of Sumerian. So soon after Sargon's state collapsed in the late third millennium, uh, Sumer and Akkad were once again dominated by one royal house. Uh, this time was centered on the old city of Ur, and this is called the third dynasty of Ur, dated from rather precisely from 2112 to 2004 BC. Um, this is the period when the number of cuneiform documents really begins to grow. A curious fact is that Sumerians seem to make a comeback, as, as I said. The documents are almost exclusively in Sumerian with few Akkadian ones. Why this happened, nobody knows. But um, despite this, scholars think that Sumerian was already well on the way to extinction at, at, at this early period. Other scholars doubt that Sumerian was dominant during War Three because more documents were for this, for this period were found in the Sumerian heartland, the city of Ur. In, in, all, in all this subject, your, your knowledge may be just a matter of random chance. We may just not have found more Akkadian texts in the Sumerian, in the uh, northern area of Mesopotamia, the more Akkadian portion. After the Ur three state collapsed, Sumerian retained its status as an official language in the south, while in the north, Akkadian dialects began to take over in writing. The last Sumerian archival letter dates from the time of Lipit Eshtar of Eason, dated, that's the 19th century BC, 1870 to 1860. By the middle of the 19th century BC, Sumerian was no longer used for administrative and accounting purposes. Letters, wills, and other everyday texts were written in, in Akkadian. You will see in Akkadian text, you will see canned Sumerian stock phrases used in, you know, in, in contracts and things like that. But they were very likely, they were read, read out loud in Akkadian. Now, we do that all the time. There are the stock phrases from Latin um, that occur in English, um, uh, e.g., what have you. Uh, schooling, however, this is what's interesting about Sumerian. The Akkadians became very attached to Sumerian because they had invented writing and um, uh, they had, the language had high prestige, much like Latin in the West after it died. Um, schooling, however, was continued in Sumerian. We know this because this, this, is the, um, this is the period where we find the largest quantity of Sumerian literary comp compositions. We have a good knowledge of educational practices in, in Southern cities such as Uruk and Ur. The curriculum consisted of the study of lexical lists, proverbs, and a few easy royal hymns in the early stages, after which a student would graduate to copying a broad range of compositions, including royal and divine hymns, epics, laments, as well as idealized debates. John, before we get to the next one, uh, there's a number, number of questions. May I read yes. it? Okay. Okay, so the first question, uh, when we say they invented written language, 
Do we know that for sure? Or is it just theirs is the oldest written record we have found so far? I would say the latter. Everything is uncertain, but they, they produce the oldest written documents. Um, it, there's, a, there's a competition here, Egypt, the Egyptians and the Chinese uh, started out about, the, it was something about the turn of the, from the fourth to the third millennium that, uh, in, that, that brought about the invention of writing. Uh, and it happened in three different places. Uh, and who gets, I'm, I'm a, you know, I, my specialty was in these languages, so I preferred the Sumerians, but um, the, the other issue is all dating is quite vague when you get back to 3000 BC. As a rule of thumb, at that time, you could assume any date you see is within 100 years of what it actually was, which we don't know. A thousand years later, the timeline gets much clearer. You can say at any date it is within 10 years of, 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 um, of when it actually was. And by the first millennium BC, when you get into the Neo-Assyrian periods and the like, the dating is quite good because they had priests who uh, watched the skies. And so we, we have good astronomical indications of, of date. That, that's a long-winded way of saying that we don't know who, we really don't know who first invented writing. Uh, it, there were three candidates and the Sumerians look like they have, they're a bit in the lead. Uh, but, uh, and it's also interesting, they, they sprung up at the same time. That suggests that merchants and people were getting around much more than we usually think they did. So the idea of writing was just in the air all the way from China to Egypt. But of course, we don't know that for sure. Does that answer the question? Or? Yes, it does. Um, okay. Now we have a question from Beverly. Uh, did the Egyptian inherited any of the parts of the language from Sumerians? Do you know? Uh, no, no, there's no indication of that. Um, e okay. Egyptian is a cousin language to Semitic. It, it looks a lot like Semitic. Uh, you know, it has the, the root system of three roots, uh, and it just had a strong Semitic feeling, but it's not a sister language to Arabic and Hebrew. It's a, a bit more distant. So one of the big problems with comparing Egyptian with Semitic is that there are very few word equivalences. As I mentioned, the word for father is the same in Arabic, Hebrew, and Akkadian. Well, that's not the case with Egyptian. And it, it went through a... Um, uh, has a very different vocabulary, which inhibits uh, comparison. But um, as far as I know, there's no hint of influence of Sumerian on, on Egyptian. I've never heard about it. But there's, there's probably some nutty person out there who thinks that. Um, <laughs> the Sumerian has been attributed to many different languages. Uh, somebody thought it belonged to the Tibeto-Burman group in East Asia, for which there was no evidence whatsoever. The most recent claim is that Sumerian is actually related to uh, the Uralic languages, languages like Finnish and Hungarian. Um, the, there are two big, two fat volumes on, on trying to prove this by a very well-known person. I, I haven't dipped into them myself, but um, it hasn't gotten much scholarly consensus. I mean, nobody really believes it. So. Interesting. And then a, a couple of other <laughs> quick questions, and maybe we can leave some for later. But um, do you know who was the first that deciphered Sumerian language? Uh, uh, the, the first big grammar was by a German guy named Arno Purbel, came out in 1922, that really put Sumerian, um, it, and it's still considered, it isn't, it's outdated, but it's still considered the, the founding grammar of Sumerian. Um, it was somewhat less, you have to understand that, that this, Akkadian and Sumerian used the same writing system. The Akkadians borrowed their, theirs from the Sumerians. And the decipherment of the writing system really is part of the history of Akkadian. Because one of the big factors, one of the big clues was an inscription um, that um, the great Persian king, Darius, at Behistun, he put a, um, he had a trilingual uh, inscription. It's, a, it's on a very high cliff that's very difficult to access, and that's an adventure story in itself. The guy who went up there to um, to to copy the inscriptions uh, was this crazy Englishman, 
but that's an adventure story in itself. But the languages that Darius used were uh, Persian, uh, Elamite, which is another little known language, and uh, Babylonian, which is the dialect of Akkadian. So that is how the decipherment of the um, Akkadian writing system began because they got, could al already read the Persian. And so they just had to do things like recognize the place names and personal names in the other inscriptions, which, which they could, and that got the ball ro rolling. But that did it for Akkadian, but it also served to decipher the Sumerian writing system. The difficulty with Sumerian is that it's a radically different language with a completely different vocabulary. So it's, it's not so much the, the decipherments that's a challenge in Sumerian, it was already done, it's just understanding what the, what the heck the texts are saying. Uh, and that, that's where the difficulty comes in. Any uh, other questions? Yes, uh, a couple more. I'll just read them quickly. Um, and then, you know, maybe they're related or so as well. So, um, so uh, for example, how do we know uh, the pronunciation of the words if there were no surviving speakers or is it assigned norm normatively by the research community? Um, well, it's, it's a matter of gathering together lots and lots of bits and pieces of evidence. Um, I won't talk about the writing system that much, but um, well, why, why I, I can answer that question by going through this slide actually. Okay. Uh, how we know. Um, now I should say I gave this slide as part of my, I gave a talk on Acadian a couple of months ago to, to this group. So if you've seen this, take it as a review. So as I said, it's likely this Marian's invented writing, but what kind of writing? There are three major types attested in the world, logographic, syllabographic, and alphabetic. And we are blessed to have an alphabet. Um, there's evidence the most natural one for people is syllabic. Um, historically, people, when they are not influenced by other cultures, will tend to create a syllabic system. The most famous example here is Cherokee, um, the American Indians. Um, their writing system was just invented in the early 19th century by a Cherokee chief. Uh, and as far as we know, he was, he was illiterate in, in English, um, but he made up a, a syllabic system. Um, people just perceive syllables better than they perceive individuals, vowels and consonants apparently. But basically logographic is focused on the meaning and it writes the whole word. Uh, syllabic is focused on sounds and writes the syllables. Uh, that's things like da and ba as opposed to be separating out the B from the A and ba. And the alphabetic is focused on sounds and writes the consonants and vowels. Uh, as we'll see, Sumerians started out as logographic. They just had pictures of things and then developed the syllabary. At no time did they or the Akkadians develop an alphabet that came later in history. Now, in reality, most writing systems are mixtures of these three types. Sumerians started out as logographic, but got more syllabic over time. Now, to give you a little example uh, from English, if you, if, you if you have never thought about writing systems before, this will hopefully clarify things. If you take the English word dollar, uh, we have the resources to write out e each consonant and vowel. So we know the you know, English word dead language and we had figured out the alphabet, we would have a good idea of what that word sounded like. So D-O-L-L-A-R, that's six symbols. To write it syllabically, we would need two symbols, one for the syllable doll and one for la. Now, actually there's only one L there, so the syllables are actually do, do, da, and one for la, but the double L is there to indicate something about the preceding vowel that it's short, that's short. Uh, but leave that aside, English, as is well known, has a famously bad uh, alphabetical system, which I, I pity anybody who has to learn English as a second language, because the hardest part is learning the spelling, I think. <laughs> but this is an, an imaginary example, as English doesn't write syllabically, but imagine dollar is written with just an at sign indicating da and a pound sign indicating la. That's a syllabic system. And to write it logographically, we need only one symbol and English happens to have one, the dollar sign. So in English, both dollar and the dollar sign represent the same word, but you can see the difference. The alphabetic version gives you an approximate pronunciation. 
The lo logogram dollar sign indicates the word, but doesn't give you any pronunciation information. So, uh, and that's one of the, the big problems with uh, what people call archaic Sumerian, the tablets I mentioned that come from about 3200 BC. It's all logograms, so we can't read them very well. We can see the meaning of, of um, the signs, but um, the other factor is they didn't bring writing systems are invented by native, native speakers generally. So they leave out a lot of the information. Uh, so all the grammatical indications, uh, the tense of the verb, the number, of, you know, if you're talking about one thing, or the, you know, the plural of the noun, they just didn't bother to write them. So we have a very, very limited knowledge of those archaic tablets. The more you get closer to an alphabet via syllable, the better able you are to understand the sounds of the language. And Sumerian, we have a pretty good grip. Uh, we know something was a D, uh, you know, uh, the letter D. We don't know what kind of D it was. In fact, there's no scholarly consensus on exactly what the phonetic, um, uh, the, the, the um, underlying phonetics were, but it was some kind of D, and that's true of the other, a P or G or what have you. That's true of the other letters. So we have a very rough understanding of the phonetics, but the text makes sense. We also have the evidence sometimes, this, this is getting down in the weeds a little bit, but sometimes if they write a logogram, they will write the phonetic indicators next to it. And this is something that's done in Egyptian writing as well. So you can read, you can, you can decipher the phonetics from the from the phonetic indicators and, and assign some pronunciation to that. So um, so does that answer that question? Are there more? Uh, yes. Uh, there's one very simple question. Uh, just wanted to ask very quickly. Uh, one of the members had asked. Do we know of the Sumerian Akkadian mythology that might shed light on the regions of the writing? Uh, well, there was a god of writing in, in uh, I mean, it had such high status that, that they had a god assigned to it, Nabu. Um, but I don't know if that has anything to do with the origins of the writing system. Usually the writing system is assumed with, with, with the onset of agriculture, um, large scale agriculture, people just had a need to um, keep track of things. And some, some person had the bright idea of writing down a picture of something and then writing, putting down the number of strokes for how many they had. It was a temple-based economy. All cities, the Sumerian cities were, were organized around the central temple and they, they were taxing people. I mean, the, the onset of agriculture has been recently portrayed as a very bad thing for the average person because it gave, gave states the ability to tax uh, and do it by force. Um, but suddenly administrative records became necessary just to know what stuff you had. Um, so before I launch into more q &A, if, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, uh, let me see one more thing. Yeah, um, yeah I can't. Uh, so somebody is asking, is Amharic included as a Semitic language? Yes, very much so. Uh, Amharic is the national language of Ethiopia. It's uh, descended from a classical form of, of the language called Gez, uh, which is still the, um, it died out as a spoken language sometime in, in 13 of, 1300 or 1400 AD, uh, uh, after the Common Era, uh, but it's still used in their religious ser services, but it's a, it's a, it's a Semitic language. Uh, Amharic is a modern Semitic language, so it's quite a bit different from the ancient ones. But um, yeah, there are about a, over a hundred Semitic languages. The big, the big five are the classical ones: the Akkadian, Arabic, classical Arabic is represented in, in documents like the Quran, uh, Akkadian Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Ethiopic, which is the the usual scholarly name for the language family that Amharic belongs to. There are multiple Ethiopic languages in Ethiopia, Tigray, Tigrinya, um, and, and Amharic. Um, so anyway, anything else? Uh, oh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, here's a nice thing I found on the internet. It gives you an idea of the 
development of the writing system. So in, in the above picture, you can see the different stages of cuneiform writing. It started out as strictly author, orthographic, no abstract concepts. They just had pictures of things, sag. And I wrote it, this, this illustration of the uncertainty. Most scholars think this is what is known as a nasalized G, uh, uh, but I just, it's just in a sag here. Uh, but you have head to watch, and it's highly logographic. You know, you can see pictures here, shoe, the word for hand. You have, you can see the five digits. There's a thumb, I guess. There's a stalk of barley. Ninder, I don't think this looks a lot like bread, uh, but water is pretty clear. This is the sun rising or setting, and bird is pretty, pretty obvious. About 200 years later, they rotated these signs 90 degrees. That has happened in other writing systems, and the usual reason is the writers are trying to avoid smudging. You know, they didn't want their hands to go over what they had written. Uh, and that may be the case here, I, it's not known, but they did, they definitely did rotate it. Um, and gradually over time, they began, it wasn't drawing on pictures, but they would take the stylus and, you know, they would sharpen the tip into a triangle and cut it into a triangle. And then they would poke the, um, the reed into the wet clay tablet and producing this triangular shape. And then they would draw the edge of the reed to get the, uh, the tail. And that's typical cuneiform. And over time, it became much more schematic and it's losing its pictorial log logographic quality. For example, you have shoe still looks kind of like a hand, but it, it lost a digit along the way. <laughs> And Shea still looks like, you know, it's the same thing, but the others are strictly, you know, this sign has nothing to do visually with water, obviously. And, but that's, that's how the system developed. Um, and now this, it, you have to recognize the, how long live this system was. It really lasted for 3000 years. Um, it, it's quite amazing what a grip writing got on, on civilization. Um, now, there were organized scribal schools from very early on. And one, ama one amazing fact about Akkadian is that they really enforced their writing standards, the shape and look on, of the signs all the way through. We think of these people as primitive, but from a scribal standpoint, they were quite, quite amazing. Um, anyway, that's it for the writing system, um, which, so, we're getting into more linguistic topics as to what Sumerian, how Sumerian worked. Of all the extinct languages of the ancient world, Sumerian has the longest literary tradition. As I said, it extended over roughly 3000 years. Now, one thing, we don't know much about the spoken language. The time span and geographical spread of the spoken language is not known. And it's a subject of much speculation that anybody ever speak Sumerian outside of the Sumerian homeland in southern, southern Iraq. We don't know that. Presumably, it was once the major vernacular in that southern part of Mesopotamia. Um, and in Mon, that's the area of Iraq south of Baghdad down to the Persian Gulf. Um, the exact borders aren't known. Now, the language did die out, pushed out by Akkadian. Estimates on the time of the demise of spoken Sumerian range from the third millennium to the middle of the second millennium BC. The consensus now is probably it was an early death, probably 18 or 1900 BC at the beginning of what scholars call the old Babylonian period. This is when Akkadian speakers were firmly in charge. There was a famous Akkadian dynasty whose most famous king is Hammurabi who ruled in Babylon. Um, and by the way, um, uh, Hammurabi is not an Akkadian name. It comes from another uh, another Semitic language that is only known, it's called Amorite by scholars, we don't know what the natives called it, but it was only known from uh, uh, names in other language, in Akkadian documents. So Hammurabi, why do we know that Hammurabi is not an Akkadian name? Because the first sound, H, is not a sound you have in Akkadian, it's, it's Amorite. So, Something that dynasty was the dynasty of foreigners, and so it raises a question. You know, I always joke: Did Hammurabi speak with an Amorite accent, which is a speak Akkadian with an Amorite accent? And the question is unanswerable, obviously. Um, well, anyway, the native des des 
designations to the land of Sumer, uh, the name of the land is Kigia. And, uh, and that means, uh, people think that it means native land, uh, Ki land, Gia, uh, native. Uh, that's a little bit uncertain. It's known as Mat Shumerim in Akkadian. The language names are Eme Gia. Again, Eme is the word for language in Sumerian. So Eme Gia would mean native language. If Gia does indeed mean people aren't too confident about that. Somehow the Akkadians came up with the name Shumer. Uh, the, the etymology of Schumer is completely unknown. We don't know where it comes from. Um, uh, so if any of you have any ideas, please, please let me know. Um, so for many centuries, Sumerian was a living language in Southern Mesopotamia. Um, by the old Babylonian period, that's approximately 1800 BC, it was limited to schools and temples, much like Latin in the West, after people stopped speaking Latin, you know, after people stopped learning Latin from, from their families as, as little children, it became strictly a school language. This, this I always found this a fascinating phenomenon. And until the uh, uh, Sumerian, because they were the inventors of writing uh, and, um, they had such high prestige, it remained a high prestige liturgical language that was used in the temple and singing hymns and the like, and it was studied throughout the Near East. The um, Overall, in the encounter of the Akkadians and the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, and we don't know how violent it was, um, you know, the, the first Semitic empire grew up and presumably they conquered cities and the like, including the Sumerian cities, uh, but we don't know how much of a, you know, how violent the, the whole process was. But it's pretty clear culturally, though, the Akkadians were politically dominant. They were clearly the junior partners uh, to the Sumerians, uh, much like the Greeks and the Romans. The Romans conquered Greece in the second century BC, but they, they, Greek, Greek culture became the cool, cult cool culture for the Romans. All the aristocrats learned to speak Greek. They were always going to Greece to learn philosophy at the feet of Greek philosophers, uh, but they were politically in charge. And it, it was a similar situation with Akkadian and Sumerian. Well, of course, we don't have the same level of knowledge. We don't even know if Sumerian was a, they still retained their own identity for very long. Uh, you know, in the first millennium BC, were there, were there Sumerians who thought of themselves as Sumerians? I, we don't have that, an answer to, to that question. Um, but as a culture, they were quite powerful. You know, the Gilgamesh epic is uh, started out, it was written in the epic as we know, it was written in Akkadian by a scribe with an Akkadian name, whether he was the actual author is unknown or did he just copy it? We don't know the answer to that. But the Gilgamesh epic started out as a collection of separate tales about Gilgamesh. Just, you know, he was a famous king of, of uh, and early, he was a historical figure, at least the name was, was attached to a historical king in the um, early third millennium. But, and they told tales about him as, they, as we do about King Arthur, who's, you know, equally uh, uh, unclear that, you know, who he was or what he was. But it's only in, you had these separate tales, it was only in the Akkadian period and, and in Akkadian, as these tales were unified in a single epic that has come down to us. It's the first uh, literary, major literary work in, in world history. And I recommend everybody read it if you haven't. Uh, well, back to linguistics. So what is Sumerian like? Uh, it's an agglutinative language. That means as you might surmise that it sticks things together. You have a little bit of Akkadian right here. Um, a dinga gal gal any akka. And again, this is only an approximate pronunciation. You know, we, we, we know this is a velar consonant, a K. We don't know if it was a G, a K, uh, if there was some other, it was a, a Kwa. We, we don't know that, uh, but we have a general idea of the pronunciation. But if you set what, if you magically got transported back to Sumeria, Sumer, um, and had to speak it, um, they wouldn't be able to understand you, I, I would imagine. But this just gives you a diff an idea of how different this is from English and Arabic and Hebrew, if you're familiar with those languages. A is the word for house, here meaning temple, and it goes first. But then you have this, dinger is the word for God, 
Galgal is big, uh, great here. Ene is a plural marker. That's where you get the S on gods. Ak is a genitive that corresponds to Av. And A is a postposition. It corresponds to the English preposition in. It's called a postposition because they stick it after the word. Um, so here you have, it's agglutinative because the habit is to take a root and then just add suffixes to it. And the suffixes are in a fixed order. You can't vary them. Uh, so the plural suffix, the adjective galgal, to dinger, the great gods, goes first, followed by the plural marker. And note that the, what's being asserted is the plurality of dinger, the great gods. Uh, and so it's removed, you know, it's one word removed from what it's pluralizing. And then you get the genitive and then you get the final preposition, meaning in the temple of the great God. So in a sense, if you look at it, it the honor is the reverse of English. Um, and you can see why it was so hard to decipher. And there's no consensus on a, a great many grammatical features in Sumerian, it's rather frustrating. But um, Sumerian has subject, object, verb, order, verb final. And that, by the way, is similar to Amharic. Uh, Amharic is verb final, it's very unusual. It, it's less usual than the other possible orders subject. And I mean, in English, was, if, if you've never been exposed to this before, in English, we say John hit the ball. We have subject, verb, object. If this was Sumerian, it would be uh, John the ball hit. And that's how, how they put things. Um, Sumerian also has a large set of cases on nouns and they are marked by postpositions. I won't go into that because it's, there is, it's, there's limited understanding and no consensus in what the, how the cases function. We understand there's a genitive meaning of, but there are lots of other cases we don't have a clear fix on. Adjectives follow nouns. You can see Dinger Galgal. -gal. And it's surrogative. Uh, that's a strange word, badly chosen, but it's the word that stuck. I'll give you an explanation of it uh, soon. Um, no, oh, I, I, I picked this. Uh, this is a. Uh, a uh, not an original, uh, I believe it's a reconstruction of a headdress, a woman's headdress found in the famous uh, Royal Cemetery, Cemetery of Ore excavated by Leonard Woolley, I believe in the 1920s. But I always like this, this headgear because it sort of looks like a dealy bopper. But this is what uh, aristocratic woman, women wore in, in Samaria. Um, and there's a rather gruesome story about that royal cemetery. There's evidence the, the, the king had died. Um, and uh, as part of the uh, uh, funeral uh, proceedings, uh, all the members of his retinue were killed and buried with him. So he took, you know, not just stuff to the other world. He took, uh, he took a bunch of people. So it, it was a major archaeological find at the time. But anyway, back to linguistics, not, not much is known about the use of Sumerian in the centuries following the, the fall of the old Babylonian state around 1595 BC. As I described in my earlier presentation on Akkadian, Akkadian was widely used for written communication throughout the Near East using the script that the Sumerians invented. It was, it was used by people other than the Akkadians, Hittites, Egyptians, various smaller kingdoms, Eratians, Koreans, what have you. It was used for, this, this was very interesting. It, it was used for interstate communication. It was, for, Akkadian was basically the first diplomatic language in world history, used, used much like Latin and French in later centuries. When, when diplomats got together, when the king of one state wanted to communicate with another, he, he hired some Akkadian scribes and they would uh, punch out a translation of what he wanted to say in Akkadian and send it to the other king. And, and likewise, so, uh, you know, for, for carrying on state affairs, you need a common language. So we know, but Sumerian was left out of the picture here. We know that some Sumerian texts were transmitted to these areas and they were used in the study of cuneiform, but there's no record of an Egyptian scribe ever, you know, writing a Sumerian tablet or anything like that. It was just Akkadian. So, for the rest of the life of Akkadian, it was definitely the major language um, as opposed to as compared with Sumerian. Sumerian was studied in schools and used in liturgical context. Sumerian prayers, laments, and incantations were remained in use in rituals. 
In the ED, they were studied, edited, and re-edited, and new texts continued to be composed even after the conquest of Babylonian by Alexander the Great in 331 BC. The status of Sumerian, in this late period, the status of Sumerian as a language used in spontaneous speech is unknown. The, what the scribes learned it, learned it in school. Did they, did they speak it amongst themselves in these later periods? We don't know. One of the challenges of dealing with the dead language, was, which is being taught in school, is that you can handle the intellectual topics, but there's no, it may have been difficult for them to carry on ordinary speech. You know, how do you say hello, goodbye, or give me a beer, or whatever? In, in Sumerian, if you're learning it in school. Now in Latin, we know there's even a spoken Latin movement today, which sounds kind of nutty, but people are kind of nutty. Um, you know, and people can get quite fluent in Latin. Uh, what the situation was with the Sumerian scribes in say 1000 BC, we don't know. Um, another issue um, is the interesting one of Sumerian dialects. Um, now, the study of these dialects is somewhat problematic. It's been hard. Nobody has succeeded in finding a group of linguistic features, things like different sounds, different vocabularies that would constitute a uh, distinct dialect. We haven't been able to correlate anything with a geographic location because dialects are typically defined geographically. One difference that has been characterized as dialectal is the distinction between a form of the language called Amegia versus Eme Sal. Remember, Eme is the word for language. Uh, gear and Sal, gear, gear, I told you meant native. I'll get back to what Sal means in a moment. As I said, Eme Gear could be, it could be called the standard form of the language. That's what's going back. The, the classical stage of Sumerian is considered to be the Sumerian uh, we have at the, at the time of the third dynasty of Ur around 2000 BC. And we say, we probably say that because it's a form of Sumerian we understand the best. <laughs> uh, so whether they thought of it as classical, I don't know. Um, uh, now, what's interesting about Emesal uh, is that it's restricted to ritual texts and the direct speech of certain goddesses and their messengers in literary texts. Although the same goddesses speak fluent Emegir and other compositions. Now, that second sign in Emesal, Sal, it has three basic readings, mi, munus, and sal. Mi is just a phonetic indicator. You can write any syllable with, with the sal sign and, it, and you know you pronounce it as mi. Now, munus and sal is also a phonetic indicator. Um, munus, on the other hand, is uh, means woman. Uh, it's a logogram. And uh, this shows that um, alter alternatively, uh, just to point out, sal, that sign could be used both syllabically and as logographs. So signs, uh, signs can have multiple readings. Now, some scholars have believed that M.A. Sal was some kind of female dialect. Now, such phenomena have been observed in modern languages, such as Australian indige indigenous languages, where women speak a different form of the language, uh, usually vocabulary. Um, they, they just used, to quote I.M. Diakonov, who was a famous Russian sumerologist of the last century, and he was also active in other fields, quote, both internal evidence and anthropological analogs seems to suggest that Emesal, whatever the exact meaning of the term might be, was actually a woman's language. Tabooing of the use of men's word and men's pronunciation is known the world over, more especially among people speaking structurally archaic er ergative languages. There's that word ergative again. I promised I, I'll explain it to you, but I, and I will. Now, I, I agree with Diakonov's opinion. I don't know about the use of the word archaic, characterizing a language with one structure as being archaic and another one as modern as, as, you know, that was a common kind of opinion in the past, but, but people don't take it too seriously today. What's interesting, um, it recalls a claim made by a Russian linguist uh, under Stalin named Nikolai Mar, I believe. He claimed the linguistic structure was, was correlated with the economic stage of a society. You know, hunter-gatherers had, had different language structures than people who practiced agri agriculture. Um, and that, that's not taken seriously anymore. And the claim was also later dismissed by Joseph Stalin himself, uh, who was bilingual in Russian and, and, uh, and uh, um, 
not Armenian, uh, Georgian. He, he, he was, um, spoke Russian with a heavy Georgian accent. But Stalin, because, probably because he was bilingual, took an interest in linguistics. So he pronounced the uh, sentence on, on Ma. I don't think Nikolai Ma ever went to a labor camp, but he came close, I suspect. But um, anyway, to get back to uh, Diakonov, what goes against his claim that Aimé Sala is a woman's language, there are practically no Aimé Sala occurrences outside the literary text. And we have thus no, we don't have any actual piece of uh, actual speech that, um, that looks like it was written down as it was spoken. There, there, um, there are juridical documents where people's testimony is recorded where they have direct quotes from people, but there is no instance of a woman giving testimony in Aimé Sal. So it may just be an accident of what the evidence we have, but given its limitation to literature, it looks like really, it looks like it was a literary dialect of some sort, but we don't, can't get much further than that. It may have just been a style of recitation or singing. Um, we just don't know. Um, What's interesting though, by the first millennium D D BC, and remember this is long after Sumerian ceased to be spoken, it's a fact that the majority of Sumerian texts, there was texts were still being produced, were liturgical M.A. Sal compositions. Somehow M.A. Sal became dominant. Um, and so by that time, most literate priests would have used M.A. Sal more than the old uh, standard Sumerian I refer to. It's, it's really very much of a mystery. Um, do, do. Yeah, just if you look at the slide, uh, the main differences are phonological. A may gear, a G corresponds to an A may sal, M, ga versus ma, udu corresponds to eze. There are also vowel differences, but we don't, you know, there's enough there. There was a difference, but we don't control, we don't understand what exactly. Now to get back to ergative, um, Now I'm giving you some sample Sumerian and English sentences. This whole area of understanding the verb is very difficult. Um, there are no consensus on some major issues. It has been said that every Sumerologist has their own version of Sumerian, particularly in the analysis of the verb. And does it really matter? Only about 200 people in the world have any command of Sumerian anyway today. <laughs> it's, it's a very small field. So here are a couple of sample sentences. Uh, now I, I told you I, I would explain why Sumerian is considered an ergative language. Ergative languages are also very characteristic, characteristic of languages in the Caucas, Caucasus region and Australia, the, the indigenous language, not, not the language of, not the English of the whites, but the Australian indigenous languages. These, these kinds of languages were not known to exist about a hundred years ago when linguists began investigating Caucasian languages. Now, I hope to get this across. Languages, they, they all need to have a way to mark the role a noun is playing in a sentence. In the first example, Lou, the word for man is the subject. Um, he's the guy raising the head. So that makes him the subject. The object is sang, that's the word for head. That's the object being raised, that's the object. And here's the verb, munsik. Now in the English equivalent is the man raised the head. And now here, the subject is marked by A, that little suffix there. And the, the object here is marked by nothing. Uh, that's very common in language. There'll, there'll be a series of suffixes or prefixes or have you, might be five suffixes or prefixes. One of them will get nothing. It's sort of like a, they're, they're conserving their resources. Um, but, and these are called the ergative and the absolutive. Uh, in ergative languages. And the critical point is, if you look at intransitive sentences, remember there, there are two classes of verbs in languages generally, um, transitive verbs that take an object and intransitive verbs that don't in English. You know, we have raise, raise is transitive, so it takes an object entered, somebody entered. And uh, let, don't let English confuse you, um, because English mixes the two types uh, freely. You can say the man entered the room or the man entered. Uh, both are good. Other languages are quite strict about um, if a verb takes an object, it has to take it. And, and similarly for, um, for intransitive verbs. 
So the critical point here is that in ergative languages, the subject of an intransitive clause sentence gets the same marking as the object of a transitive sentence. So the man entered, and so um, in English, and in English we, we use word order uh, to make the difference. What comes before the verb is the subject. Generally, there are exceptions. Uh, in a transitive clause is the subject. What comes before the um, what comes before an intransitive verb is also the subject. So you have subjects being marked in the same way. In ergative languages, they're very different. Um, so so um, this, as you might, as you might understand, this raise made it very difficult. Uh, for for uh, Sumerian to be deciphered because it was such a radically known. In fact, when when the language was first being looked at by scholars, people didn't even know there were ergative languages or understand their properties. Now they do to some extent. So it's been fir firmly established that that Sumerian was was ergative, um, and it is a radically different way of structuring structuring your language. Um, so in English, if, if you're having trouble. It's like in English, we say the man entered. If, if it were more Sumerian-like and ergative, we would say entered the man, um, since entered is an intransitive verb most of the time. The man is the subject, uh, but it, since it's word order in English that, that determines the marking, it would have to come after the, after the verb. Um, so anyway, I, I hope that was a successful explanation, uh, was it? <laughs> and and that's all I have on Sumerian today. Excellent, John. What okay. I'm going to do is um, I'm going to read a couple of other questions we had yeah. along the way, if you don't mind. And then um, and then we'll open up and I'll unmute people as they want to ask questions. And maybe our panel have some questions. So let me just... Um, so first question is coming from Ebrahim Muhammad, saying, how are we sure what logograms refer to? For example, a logogram for head, water, and bird seems easy, but how do we know about the day? And how uh, about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we, we don't, um, in, so if Sumerian had been discovered and we didn't know about Akkadian, it would still be unreadable. But as I said, there was such Akkadian was deciphered first, and they used the same writing system, the two languages. And Akkadian is a lot like other Semitic languages that are well known. So when we saw, you know, an Akkadian write kalb for Arabic, which is identical to Arabic dog, um, people realized that. So it, it really reinforced our understanding of how to read Akkadian. And Akkadian, it's sort of a Bootstra bootstrapping approach. If you can, we can read Akkadian much better than we can read Sumerian, but we also used Akkadian to understand Sumerian better because um, Akkadian uses a lot of Sumerian logographs, like the sign for head, the sign for dog, what have you. They borrowed it in, but they also frequently wrote them phonetically. Um, so we know it a lot of our understanding, maybe most of our understanding of Sumerian comes from our understanding of Akkadian. And there were disputes over, it just happened that the, the um, I just discovered a word that was always read as she, that's the word for Bali in, in Akkadian. It's now been reclassified. They think it now was pronounced as ku. And I, I don't know the arguments precisely, but now these, these languages are constantly evolving. And if you want to assign a it's hard to develop a statistical model, you know, how well do we understand Akkadian or Sumerian? I would say Akkadian, we know a whole lot. Uh, the, some texts you read and you get the feeling you're getting 98% of what a native speaker, a living Akkadian got out of that text. Other texts are totally opaque. Uh, Sumerian is much less well understood. I, mean, I remember, and I, I always found it, I, I like to do the linguistics, so I don't like to mess around with, you know, trying to get the basic understanding of a text. Uh, so Sumerian was always somewhat distasteful to me. Uh, I remember reading one 
one text where the, the editor admitted, we don't know if this text, this Sumerian text is in the first person or the third person, <laughs> which, I mean, it makes it uh, rather, you know, it's uncertain. So uh, we, we, have, we have good ideas, um, but the, the degree of disagreement among scholars is quite large. Um, so, okay. so it's semi, it's better than semi deciphered. The other languages that are much worse off, we, we know basically very little or nothing about them. But Sumerian was lucky, it's a difficult language, language isolate, no known, known relatives, but the Akkadians used the same writing system. And Akkadian was much easier to understand. Excellent. We have Paul, Paul that has raised the question. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I, want, I want to just add something. Um, it, it turns out really kind of by coincidence, John, that I've been reading uh, Jeremy Black's Literature of Ancient oh. Sumer, from yes. David Course, and in it he talks about how uh, uh, Rawlinson, who was one of the discoverers of Akkadian, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, in order to resolve skepticism about whether Akkadian really existed and was accurately translated, held a competition in which uh, he uh. handed out um, a, a, a piece of uh, selection of Akkadian language to, I think, 10 or so different scholars and had them independently translate it. And they came back and the translations were essentially identical. Yeah. So they confirmed that they really had very good knowledge of Akkadian. And they yeah. tried to do the same thing about 50 years later with Sumerian and the translations were completely different, yeah. uh, indicating that the, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, conclusion is kind of obvious that scholars, you know, we really do understand Akkadian very well, Sumerian, not so much. Yeah, and that's, that's the situation. I, I will say when Rollinson did that test, they, they had a good idea of the grammar, but their pronunciation was, was quite bad, like the, um, you know, George Smith, the, the guy who discovered the flood story uh, in Gilgamesh, um, thought the name Gil Gilgamesh was actually Isduba, which possesses not a letter in common with the name we realize now is Gilgamesh. So uh, things, they're constantly evolving. I see some places where he's referred to as Bilgamesh. Well, that was the Sumerian form of the name. And there's a, a how it became, got from Bilgamesh to Gilgamesh, I don't know. But the Sumerians knew him as Bilgamesh. And there's an interesting story connected with like that. And a Syriologist made a claim that the Gilgamesh story pops up in the Arabian Nights uh, in connection with a character called Bulakia which would, you know, it's plausible it's a short form of Bilgamesh, but the initial letter is B, um, which recalls the Sumerian form of the name Bilgamesh. Well, there's the, the argument against that, there's no way that medieval Arabs would have known about Sumerian. So, the, you know, the fact that they're using a Sumerian name just sort of makes the argument, renders the argument uh, void. Um, but yeah, the knowledge of, I wish th this sort of thing could be tracked statistically, you know, how well do we understand Akkadian? Um, how, uh, how much progress are we, are we making in understanding Akkadian? I have the impression it's sort of stalled, you know, the sort of treading water, there are minor improvements here and there, but it's not really getting fundamentally better. Um, but you can't ask people in the field that they get touchy about that sort of thing. But Sumerian is clearly, uh, I won't say poorly understood, but there is no consensus on a great many things, so. We have another question, uh, John, uh, from Anna Shurik. I'll unmute her, she'll ask her question. Go ahead, Anna. Okay. Anna? You're muted, Anna. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Okay, so uh, I guess one of the comments I wanted to make originally, um, so, I have, uh, I joined really late, I'm sorry. I, I'm in a different time zone and I got mixed up, like a, so I missed most of it. But I have some linguistic background uh, associated with other languages. And, um, sorry, now I'm losing my, my train of thought. So I, I was wondering if, I guess, a correlation, you know, you have, um, like, if, for example, you were talking about in English, how you converted to Gilgamesh from, uh, what was it, the original pronunciation? Gilgamesh. 
um, what I've noticed, I guess this is just my personal comment on it, being multilingual, is that I've noticed that in English, a lot of times uh, we modify the proper, the pronunciation of actual proper nouns and make them totally incorrect. So I think that's just a tendency in the English language uh, as a general rule of thumb. Um, so a lot of geographic locations, for example, get modified. Uh, and yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, 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 so a perfect example off the top of my head is uh, uh, Moscow in Russia, the Russian city of Moscow. Well, in Russian, it's Moskva. Yeah. You know, how did you get a cow out of it? Seriously. <laughs> So you have a lot of these kind of just linguistic, you know, modifications, you know, within the actual languages. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. In place names, there's always a distinction between what what, what are the proper called? nouns in general. In just, proper, like, place yeah. names in particular, usually the natives will have their own name for a place, and then some it gets transmogrified in the other language. And my favorite one is Livorno, a city in Italy, somehow ended up in English as Leghorn. And that, that's not a general phonetic that doesn't comport with the jet, you know, the phonetic tendencies of, you know, in borrowing long, long words into English. It's just a blue moon sort of thing. Somebody called it Leghorn and it's stuck. Um, so there's a lot of, um, yeah, play names change when they transfer from language to language. The names have to be adopted to the to the native phonetic capabilities of the speakers involved of. Uh, we, we all know in Russian, you know, the, they don't have a letter H. Uh, so well, a name like Hitler do, ended right? up as Dietler in, in Russian. Well, that's, it, it, actually, there is an H in Russian. It's a H. It yeah. looks like the X in English. That's the Russian yeah. H. But the thing is, for, for some bizarre reason, and I cannot explain to save my life, why uh, a lot of, um, whenever you have um, an SH, they convert it to a... Uh, yeah. So, uh, what is it? Uh, I'm trying to think of, of the locations of Hitler. Uh, yeah, we put a G, even though we do, we, 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 could have, we, we, we do have a, a H sound. It does yeah. exist. Well, I'm not, not the pure H. You're talking um, about, there's a phonetic difference between that Russian sound you mentioned and, and the name in Hitler, uh, because that's a pure H. There's no, it's just, Ha is just, the air coming out of your mouth with with no closure well, in your larynx, but, but that other sound you mentioned, there is Thank a little you. bit of a closure. Uh, Hillary Clinton has the same. In Greek, I discovered uh, Greece Greek had a had a true H with which they mark with that well, symbol Hebrew, on, on the top of the letter. Variations of an H in, in Hebrew, you have a a yeah. a yes. a head and a ha. Yeah, um, and I can never remember which one is the harder between the head and a cup. Yeah, no, no, uh, you're correct. Uh, I mean, Hillary. I was doing a project on Greek once, and if you look, her name is typically uh, transliterated with a high, uh, a high sound, as in chi squared. Mm -hmm. It's not a real H. It's an H with a little bit of constriction in the throat. So it's more like Hillary. That's how they pronounce it, but it's just a matter of names have to be adapted right, to the but like in the, For example, the Chicago uh, in Russian, we have a chef. We totally have a chef, but they say uh, Chicago. We make it into a CH a lot of times, hmm. a, a lot of the cities, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay, you know. Um, so my point is that if the language is, so when you're talking about the proper pronunciation, you know, it, in most cities you pronounce uh, of, yeah. from places other than the that same language as um, native language location are going to be modified. I guess is my main point. So yeah. that, that includes all proper names. You know, like yeah. I always make fun of when people go, go pronouncing some some famous Russian. And I'm like, oh, please don't butcher it. The Tana Kuskuriak. You you also the Tana Kuskuriak. Well, Russian 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 is a difficult language phonetically. So please. Have some forgiveness for foreigners as they just aren't capable of palatalizing their consonants. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. I, I'm just well, making a point that this is the same thing across all languages. Anna, спасибо. Следующий Paul, я извиняюсь. Anna, thank you. Uh, Paul, I understood that. Go ahead. So, uh, as, as specifically regards the Sumerian, 
one of the when they when they, when there was still controversy about whether Sumerian actually existed. In fact, there were some scholars that advanced the idea that Sumerian was just a a different way a different way of representing the Akkadian language for sacred purposes and so forth. But one of the arguments that was used to demonstrate that uh, Sumerian was a separate language is the fact that uh, cuneiform does not contain sounds that are required for the Akkadian language. So there was the conclusion that, that cuneiform must have been invented for a language other than Akkadian. Well, like, for example, uh, major, the SH sound is not yeah, in yeah. Sumerian. Well, uh, that's true. The, um, the, the main piece of evidence, though, is that um, generally when people create a script, it's a pretty good match for their language. They get all, all the sounds that they need in, in the alphabet or the syllabary or what have you. Uh, the, the main reason that people realize that the Akkadians did not invent cuneiform is that it's a really bad match for Akkadian. For example, the Akkadian... Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Yes, it's, it's, and, it's, and the, the other side of that problem is that the uh, sound system of Sumerian looks a lot like that of Akkadian. The Akkadian has three vowels. Uh, the big difference is Sumerian has four, A, I, A, I, U, and I'm speaking letters here, A, E, A, and A uh, has four, uh, but it seems we're looking at Sumerian phonetics through an Akkadian lens. Um, so we, there's always that doubt, doubt about and you, you, on the you can still read the language even if you don't know very well how it was pronounced. There was a, a comment earlier that I saw in the chat where someone was asking, uh, "Who were the writers and readers of Sumerian within the society who was capable of dealing with the language?" Uh, well, it was definitely really there, there's there's no evidence of female literacy. Um, there's very little evidence of aristocratic literacy. Uh, well, so what's his name? Well, Asabanapal is famous for bragging about he could read tablets from be before the, the flood. Um, so even aristocrats, you know, by his making that claim, he was pointing out his peers couldn't read and write. Um, and the way, if you look at all Babylonian letters, the greetings are speak to so-and-so, thus says uh, another person. It was so, clearly that somebody was reading out the letter to the addressee. Yeah. So, so the addressee was illiterate. So it was a small group of people. And if you've ever seen some cuneiform tablets, they can have extremely small signs. The signs can be very tiny. So it was a young man's game. So um, Jer Jeremy, you, Jeremy Black also points out that there's evidence that shows that um, even though um, you have the recording of all of these hymns and, and so forth in written Sumerian, that, that the primary translation was, um, was verbal, was oral. Uh, and that one of the arguments for that is that is, is the errors that are found between different versions of the same text. Oh yeah, you can, you can identify those, they're called her, her, and her failure. And many errors. of those errors are things like total paraphrases, yeah. the sort of, of, of error that you would make if you heard the story and you, did, and you remembered the gist of it, but you didn't exactly remember yeah. the text, as opposed to the sort of errors where you just would copy a character incorrectly, which is what you would, what you would suspect it was purely written transmission. So basically the, the, the notion is that the the, the society as a whole would have heard all of these stories verbally because that's the way the scribes heard them as well. They weren't tr primarily transmitted as written texts. Yeah. Thank you. We have, a, we have a raised hand by Wayne. Let me unmute Wayne. Wayne? I'm here. Hi, John. It's a pleasure. Hi, it's a pleasure listening to you. I have to say that I oh, don't understand you. that, but the first step is just to listen. I'd like to know how did the Hebrew language start? Abraham came from Ur, so he didn't speak Hebrew. Where did it originate from? 
Well, it's it's uh, part of the Western Semitic language family, uh, and the subfamily of that group is called Canaanite languages spoken in and around the land of Canaan. Um, it's it has we know Hebrew had several relatives. Uh, there's an inscription in Moab, in Moabite, which is a language which is very close to Hebrew. Uh, so it emerged out of a group of Semitic. Uh, dialects that uh, you know that they the people who migrated to what's now Israel and Syria brought their languages with them we aren't entirely sure where they came from uh, the language about Abraham and or the Chaldees uh, may be accurate so they they came from the original or it's not proven though um, because there is no evidence. They came from somewhere. The whole question of the the location of the proto-Semites is all over the map, Northern Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, what have you. Nobody really knows. But, it, uh, he, but the, there were a group of languages that happened to be uh, resident in uh, places like Phoenicia and, and uh, the land of Canaan uh, that are all closely related. Phoenician is also close to... Uh, the, the language spoken by the Phoenicians is also close to Hebrew, just in terms of structure and vocabulary. Uh, they, they look a lot like each other. So it emerged out of that, that dialect. Why Hebrew is the way it is, because there's some really weird fat features about Hebrew, is unclear, but every language evolves in its own way. Um, so I hope that answers the question. All right. And how about the Hebrew alphabet? How was that created? That was the first... Uh, version of the Hebrew alphabet, it was, this is before the Jews were Jews and th there was no Hebrew, was invented in Egypt. Uh, it was a group of lay, some people just started writing um, consonants on, on shards of, on stone. Some, sometime in the second millennium BC, it's called the proto, um, it's a proto alphabet. I forget the scholarly name for it. Some, some genius had the idea of writing uh, of writing letters and, and abandoning writing of syllables. Uh, and it, it be began the uh, Semitic habit of only writing consonants. And that has to do with the structure of the languages. I won't get into it, but that's where it started. And it's descended down um, uh, to, to the Hebrews. Now, what we think of Hebrew script today, you know, the familiar square script you see in printed Bibles and newspapers and the like, that's not the original Hebrew script. What they actually use today is Aramaic, is of Aramaic origin, which is another, not as close as Phoenician to Hebrew, but it's a, another language related to Hebrew. Uh, at some point, the Hebrews abandoned the original script um, and, and adopted an Aramaic one. And that, of course, the, the Jewish community was, you know, by, by the turn of the, uh, by zero AD, they were heavily bilingual in Aramaic and, uh, and Hebrew. And the languages are so close, it, it raises interesting questions about the effects of one language upon the other. And Hebrew died out as a spoken language. So um, the script is, um, is Aramaic in origin, but a lot of the Hebrews were speaking Aramaic on a daily basis by that time. So, so it comes right. down to- And, and, and John, one, uh, let me ask you one other question. Yeah. Cuneiform, I believe it has linear A and linear B. One of those, I forget which, was never translated. What's yeah, the problem in correct. translating it? Why well, the problem? Well, I, I think linear A, the, the, the part of the Mycenaean culture, linear B was, is Greek. It has nothing, uh, nothing to do with cuneiform, but it's the, uh, it was uh, an ancient, an old, very old form of Greek. Uh, and, uh, and Linear B was successfully deciphered by Michael Ventris, who, an architect who just was very good at decipherment. Linear A has never been deciphered, mainly because there's insufficient attestation of text. That, that's my understanding anyway. I've never worked on it, so I have other people's opinions. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, anytime. Uh, we have Patty. Thank you. Questions? Sorry, go ahead. Patty? Okay, uh, I wasn't sure if John had something to say. Um, I should say I am by no means um, well conversant with any of this. So I find what you're telling us and explaining to us fascinating. 
So actually, there were two different observations I had. Um, it seems like there's a very mixed group here, some with more sophistication on these topics than others. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that um, a lot of what you're explaining to us um, relates to the art and science of, of the whole uh, ability to discover and interpret and decipher language. Yeah. And I just wondered if it might be popular among people um, or, you know, desirable um, to organize a program specifically around those kind of the tools and growth and development of these skills. Um, I don't know. It could just be the way I tend to organize information, but that was just a thought. I don't know if other people would be interested. And then... Um, because I do find what you're saying fascinating, but I, it's like, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to go back and forth uh, between several languages that you've talked about. Um, so, and the other one was simply an observation on something that um, you brought up and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't specifically remember the context, but it occurred to me based on what you were talking about that agriculture in and of itself um, would have, had to encourage more settled communities, which in turn would have required the ability to um, communicate with the increasing efficiency and um, also an, an agreement. And, and that would have also just in and of itself encouraged record keeping, which is basically what we're kind of discovering, right? When, when, when we're looking at languages. So just your thoughts on those things. Again, I realize they aren't very well organized as questions, but um, just points of interest. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm no expert on the origins of agriculture. I just, a book came out recently, I forget the title, that claimed that agriculture was a really bad day for most of humanity because of all of a sudden, you know, in, in pre-agriculture -agri days, you know, that you just ate what you gathered, hunted and gathered every day. You didn't store anything. The minute you got agriculture, you were storing stuff. And that introduces the, the guys who are good at violence are just going to move in and take over. It's just human nature. And that's how how civilization got going. And, you know, you know that slavery was the, you know, the, the one of the first thoughts in their heads, I suspect. <laughs> So it said the hunter-gatherer life may have been much more enjoyable. You didn't live very long, but you didn't have to work very hard. That's an awful lot more people are able to live under agriculture. Yeah. So when you say that the life of the average person got worse, well, yeah. the the number yeah. of people that that included that average uh, started increasing exponentially. And yes. look at, at, at the, the results. I mean, here we are today. And I would argue that our lives are better than those of people who had a life expectancy of 24 years or something. And a childhood mortality rate of 80% or higher. And I, I'm personally, I'm very skeptical of, of those types of cynical revisionist analysis. Yeah, that, right. You know, oh, agriculture made life worse. You know, come on, get real. That's crap. Yeah, that, that's true. Forgive me. It just sounded entertaining. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I agree with you, actually, as, as you bring, remind me of certain facts. We have Anna, who has another question. And after that, uh, let me ask, let me unmute her. Anna? Okay. Yeah, I actually just did a presentation on this this week uh, in class as I teach anthropology. And uh, so this is one of the things we were discussing to, uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. And there's an article that talks uh, about, about the, um, you know, the worst mistake uh, the human race has ever made, which was, he argues to be agriculture. Now, I'm not saying it's 100%, but, one, but some of the data he presents in there, and I'm sort of referencing it from my PowerPoint over here on the side. Let me see, if I can share it, I can, I can, I can share the part in my screen if you like. But um, you know the Bushmen. When you compare the Bushmen to the early farmers, they had uh, many more different uh, variation of different kinds of proteins. Ninety-three grams of protein, seventy-five uh, different wild plants that they consumed, as compared to the primary uh, staple foods of wheat, corn, and, and uh, rice. 
you know, that uh, that have evolved as a result of agriculture. You know, look at a lot of uh, dietary issues right now. You know, things that have evolved, like diabetes, and a lot of you know are associated with the limited food options. You know, so I know there are promotions about a more European diet, etc. But uh, you know, to have more variation. But this is one of the problems. And some of the additional statistics there is that the average height of the Bushmen at that time for men was 5'9", for women 5'5". Five five. And for the farmers, men were 5'3", and women were 5 foot. You know, you had, you mm. know, in, in anthropological data, you have better bones and teeth uh, in the Bushmen. Uh, you have a nearly 50% increase in animal, um, Ms. Grant, not uh, enamel. Okay, sorry. Mm. Enamel uh, defects compared to the mm. Bushmen. The life expectancy of the Bushmen was 26 compared to life expectancy of 19 with the early farmers. So there mm. are some consistent data actually. Uh, now, I understand with the population growing eventually, uh, you have to sort of settle down. And it's another sort of contradiction in itself is that uh, uh, archaeologically, it seems, uh, and anthropologically, that women are resp were responsible for developing yeah. agriculture. Since men were the ones usually out hunting, women were the ones uh, eventually developing uh, agriculture. So, but at the same time, once it settled down, it impacted women quite a bit in the sense of them making them almost into a secondary, like slave like role, because now they were for forced to have more children, which they couldn't have as many children when they were moving around mm -hmm. because they couldn't carry infants all the time. So, they have to reach a certain age to be able to migrate. You know, but once you're stable in one place, you could have a bunch of uh, kids back to back to back, so to speak, and there would be additional farm labor as they as they get a little bit older. Well, I've, um, I've, I've seen that kind of argument in connection with the industrial revolution, where the data is much much more complete and more more accurate than anything about the prehistoric period. But you know, the early industrial re revolution worsened people's health over their their uh, their ancestors, uh, you know, heights and, you know, heights varied, uh, the but teeth that was. So, I, but I agree with Paul overall, you know, the, the, particularly the last 200 years have been incredibly good for humanity. Um, well, thanks to science. Is that across the world, it's not just a Western quest question, but a billion people have been raised out of poverty in the last, uh, last 40 years. Uh, and, and that's quite a remarkable achievement. So, and when I mean po poverty, I mean not not being on welfare, but living on a dollar a day. Uh, well, uh, I think Paul and could speak about it earlier in uh, our um, meetups uh, had made a presentation on uh, the rough terrain of the Iraq and uh, how the irrigation system was set up. Um, as opposed to Egypt, right? Egypt was more of a kind of breadbasket, you know, all their lives. And I mean, notwithstanding a Nile was drawn right now, but the Iraq was such a tough terrain where the Akkadian and Sumerian culture was set up. And the irrigation was such an, uh, an amazing uh, achievement. Paul, maybe you can speak about it a little bit. Sure. Um, it, it all comes from the geography of Mesopotamia. So, the location of where the Sumerian cities were, the, the land is extremely flat. The, the amount of, uh, of slope uh, over which uh, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers descend um, is much higher in, in Northern and even in Central Mesopotamia uh, than it is in Southern Mesopotamia. And, um, the normal tech, you know, the, the kind of simple techniques of agriculture that we think of, uh, where you just kind of let water into a field and then you just let it drain, uh, has, it doesn't work in the long term because what happens is that the um, salts um, parts precipitate out of the, uh, the water and the land becomes infertile. And what was developed in the Sumerian regions uh, was something called long field agriculture, where the fields were um, 
uh, really engineered so that water would be introduced at the top of a long field on a slope and would flow down through the field and then exit through a perpendicular canal at the bottom so that the, basically it would wash the salt away rather than having the salt precipitate out and make the, the land infertile. And um, one of the arguments, uh, the leading historian making this argument is, is Mario Leverani, uh, an Italian historian. Uh, and um, his, uh, his thesis basically is that this was be impossible without the organizational uh, mediation of the temple. Hmm. That, the, the, that for all intents and purposes, that without the temple, and therefore, by the way, the, the um, development of, of writing systems in order to keep track of all this stuff uh, and, and a centrally distributive economy, a redistributive economy where everything flows into the center uh, and then it's distributed out of the center that, that, you, you, that the, essentially this was the value that was provided by the, the central religious institutions. We think of sometimes of this as just being kind of a superstitious method of controlling ignorant people, but uh, the, the argument that Liverani is advancing was that they were, that this was the organizational principle that made civilization possible. Hmm. I, I, the, my current professor, I, I mentioned this to him and he said that that, uh, that this view, that Liverani's view of becoming increasingly uh, well accepted uh, among the, the community of historians that the main people objecting to it are the archeologists, uh, and, um, which, you know, I, I, I don't know more than that, but it's very interesting. You know, you guys are, um... I had really just thought of this as, a, like, a, as I told Zach, a kind of amusing um, in terms of connecting the development of language and understanding why settled communities, uh, you know, brought about probably by um, agriculture, would have um, been a prime mover in development of ability to communicate. Um, but as you guys have have built on that, I, at first I thought, oh no, I moved the entire the discussion completely outside of um, language. But you just brought it back again, Paul. And yeah, all of this makes sense. And I'm I'm thinking, wow, I hope somebody does programs about these things that we're talking about because you, I never even thought of the connection. I mean, as soon as you said it, it's like duh. But I never would have thought about. Oh, if we, if we didn't have agricultural communities, we wouldn't have settled communities, we wouldn't need slavery. Never thought of that, you know? There's a very, I, let me recommend this, a book. It's a very short book, almost a pamphlet called, just called Uruk, U-R-U-K by Mario Liverani. It's translated into English and it's a really tremendously uh, mm -hmm. idea, dense book, a great read. Uh, and it's you know I mean, not much more than than 125 pages or something like that. Uh, really, uh, highly recommend that book to anybody that really wants to, you know, delve into this a little deeper. Uh, we, sorry. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. So you continue. No, I'm just going to thank him for the reference because, like I said, he just opened up this like massive areas <laughs> that that I think oh this would be so interesting to learn more about. So um, thank you all. Well, no. Yeah, I wish we had it recorded for we did a really good job explaining the connection. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the first lectures we did in person back then. Yeah, that was in the <laughs> bar on uh, it was, right. 33rd Street or wherever it was. 20, <laughs> yeah, it was 29th Street. Unfortunately, you know, with, uh, we didn't record it, but that's all right. We might repeat it. Um, yeah, that would be, I, I think that would be like a whole new area. And I think these are things that... Um, you know, part of what I see going on nowadays, especially in our culture, is that so much of these basics have, are like so taken for granted that we don't even think about them. And yet they apply to exactly what's going on right now, even though it might be hard to see if, if that makes any sense, what I'm saying. Um, yes. People are completely um, 
flummoxed in terms of literally communicating with each other, which just keeps getting worse and worse the, um, in the in the attempt at dialogue. Um, and there's a whole lot of cynicism. People are using that level of confusion and um, lack of depth <clears throat> cynically. They're exploiting it cynically simply to create um, power you know, to, to carve out power grids or, or power areas of, of influence. And uh, it, it just entirely seems so cynical to me. Um, and I can't, in, in my thinking or experience or learning, I'm, I can't think of anything that was built successfully and, and endured any length of time that was built entirely on that kind of cynicism but I could be wrong. And, and maybe I'm misinterpreting things that you're saying. Well, thank you, Patricia. We have two more questions that I think we missed. Uh, we, we apologize. And I think one question is, um, could you talk about Behit's tune inscription and the history of how they learned to decipher Sumerian? Um, I, I think I covered that to some extent. Okay, okay got it. Got I don't it. know when the question came in. That was that was uh, earlier. Okay. Uh, another question. This was really interesting because, uh, you know, when I visited Istanbul, Istanbul Archaeological Museum, I uh, was always interested. But one person, I don't know if it's a question. It says Sargon's daughter and Huduana who yeah. was supposed to be the first woman to sign her writing in the Kenyan uh, written in the first person. That, um, that, that's correct. Do we know anything no. like that in regarding to the Sumerian? Because I have seen a lot of no, no, I think nothing. But I, I don't know. She had a Sumerian name. Um, I think, I, I, I think, John. I think there's evidence that shows that Akkadian speakers, uh, when they would be elevated to a religious station, would take Sumerian names. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I know this from um, having researched a, a, a person named Ur Utu, which is a Sumerian name. Utu was the, uh, the Sumerian sun god. And uh, we know about him because uh, his house, uh, and he lived in the, in the old Babylonian hmm. period, maybe three generations after uh, Hammurabi. His, there was a fire in his house. And all of his tablets were therefore preserved mm. accidentally. And um, so people have got a tremendous amount of context for these tablets because he had a huge archive, a huge private archive in mm. his house. And they learned a great deal just by looking at the different types of documents and how they were commingled and so forth. But he was... Um, what was called, he was uh, called the, the Gala Ma. Gala was a, a type of priest mm. uh, called a lamentation priest, the singer of lamentation songs. And Ma, John will say, tell me in, in Sumerian means chief or head, right? So the mm. Gala Ma was the high lamentation priest. Mm. And the indications that he had uh, a, uh, an Akkadian name and took on the name Or Utu when he when his father died. Do we know what the Akkadian name was? Father's position. Do we know what the Akkadian name was? Uh, you know, I, I could look it up for you. I don't recall. I, I wrote a paper on it actually 10 years ago. Oh, okay. There's, there's a slight and problem. It, it, was I don't... Only, it, it was only a speculation because in this document, they talk about this person uh, who is identified. They know who his father was, what his father's name is. And they talk about his sons and one of his sons all of a sudden disappears hmm. from the record at the same time that Or Utu appears in the record, which is right after the father dies. So the, hmm. the, the uh, hypothesis is that the father dies, the son with the Akkadian name inherits the position and takes on a Sumerian name uh, at that time. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a case, you know, the Akkadians wrote both logographically and syllabically. Um, and they used a lot of Sumerian words as lo logographs. I'm trying to think in, in names, a lot of names are written 
both syllabically and with a lo logograph included um, from taken from Sumerian. I'm trying to think of an Akkadian name that's completely in in uh, logographs, and I can't think of one. So if you have a name like which just has two logographs, like the name you mentioned, or or Utu, yeah, that does look Sumerian. It's not Akkadian, but, but it's not a common occurrence. I know that and, usually. And, you, and incident, and you know, relative to the other thing you were saying, these um, lamentations were written in the Emesol dialect or the Emesol oh, form, yes. uh, which, you know, so this is, is um, uh, being uh, preserved and continued in a pure, in, in, a, in a mainstream Macadian society in, in the old Babylonia, which is, you know, arguably the, the high watermark of, yeah, of the, the Akkadians. Yeah, it was the most famous dynasty, Hammurabi was, was the king. And by the way, to give you an idea of the uncertain, the name is always given as Hammurabi in, in modern languages, um, but we don't know for sure if that B was a B, it may have been a P, and a lot of people think it was a P, a hum, because it, it has an etym etymology, a good etymology in Semitic, Hammurabi, Hammurabi, not Hammurabi, but that's because the sign that's used to write it is, 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 uh, Ambiguous. It can be B or P. I and isn't, isn't that part of the natural uh, evolution of, of language that 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 you know uh, consonants become vocalized? Yeah, or that's will a, lose their vocalization. You know, as time goes on. But it's never. Yeah, it's 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 one of the uncertainties. We don't. We aren't. Most scholars accept Hammurabi because it's a better et etymology. It means Amu you know, is that the god name Amu is a healer. Um, but uh, Rabi, it also has a reading great, but there's just doubt about it. We aren't quite sure. We got most of the name, but not 100%. I have another question in the chat. Um, so Ibrahim Muhammad Musa asked, where in the world currently is the best research in, on Sumerian going on? Do you think going forward, statistically and computationally, techniques will be important in improving our understanding of Sumerian? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. I think about it. One of the, I mean, Sumerian is a very isolated, lonely activity, and there, there isn't that much documentation. So I don't think statistical techniques are going to be much help. You know, if you digitize all, all the Sumerian material and then run sophisticated algorithms on it, you'll get to a higher level of understanding. I'd be very surprised. There just isn't that much stuff. But as far as the best, historically, the best school for Sumerian was the University of Pennsylvania. The greatest American Sumer Sumerologist was uh, Samuel no Noel Kramer, who, who died several decades ago, but that's where it made great advances. Today, I don't know. It's you, it's Humanities still. are in such bad shape. That, you know, the, the number of Sumerology, Sumer Number of employed sumerologists is probably about in the single digits at this point. <laughs> so it's a, probably on life support, actually. Uh, I, I Acadian think, is I much you're better. Right about University of Pennsylvania, and I think probably the second one would be the University of Chicago. Yeah, that's true. Yes, I've, that's slipped my mind. Uh, yeah, Chicago had the um, great Acadian dictionary project that just completed 10 right. years ago. Uh, and they actually took the took them 80 years, but they actually finished it. It's one of those mon maniacal dictionary projects that go on for generation. You know, sadly, the University of Pennsylvania started a Sumerian dictionary project back in the 80s, but it stopped after the second volume. And I don't quite know what happened. The, the origin of all this was um, in the 19th century, the um, the uh, pioneers of excavation of, of the um, Mesopotamian civilizations were the French and the Germans. Uh, and then uh, kind of in the second half of the 18th century, of the 19th century, the Americans got involved and did excavations at the, um, the city of Nippur, which is now called Nippro, I think mm. is the way it's, it's pronounced. And they found um, tens of thousands of tablets that turned it out turned out to be in Sumerian, and they sent thirty thousand of these to the University of Pennsylvania. 
Yeah. That is. Which is which is how the University of Pennsylvania became established as the center of Sumerian studies. Yeah, I, I would say overall the nation that's contributed the mo most to Sumerian study, definitely Akkadian, is, is Germany. Uh, they 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 they, they produce the best philologists in the world. They're remarkably good at reading texts. So. But that's historical. I don't think what's true today, it's sort of distributed. There just aren't very many jobs. So I mean, I gotta say, you know, my I'm currently taking a course at Columbia, and my professor seems to be a, a sumerologist, and he's young. Oh, okay. You know, he's definitely, I don't think he's 40 years old yet. What's his name? Uh his name is um uh his last name is Shelley, uh, and he's, by the way, you know, distantly related to Percy Bysshe Shelley, Nathaniel hmm. Shelley. Huh. And, and once again, ironically, I, he was my TA 10 years ago when I hmm. took my first course with uh, Mark van der Meeru, hmm. who is certainly a Sumeriologist and a Syriologist. Yeah. He's, he's, a, a, he, he's, he's in the Midwest of Oklahoma or someplace like that? No, Columbia. I, I, I meant to van der... No, Vandermeer up is in Columbia. Yeah. Oh, he is. Okay. Yeah. He, oh, okay. Last time I noticed he was in the Midwest somewhere. I don't think so. He's been in Columbia. I mean, I, I had I studied with oh. him ten years ago. Uh, and as far and he, you know, he's very active in the international community. He's the guy that translates Mario Liverani, by the way. Oh, okay. He he's I wouldn't know about Mario Liverani without Vandermeer. Hmm. Yeah. But anyway, uh, sumerology is a very small field. So interesting, is and, it? And uh, apparently, the um, when I'm reading Jeremy Black now, he talks about the using these um, computational um, methods of dealing with 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 Sumerian, and he seems to think that they're making great progress with that. Well, of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> this is. The hunt for funding. <laughs> yes, so yes. You come up and say, I've solved the problem. You'll never get a dime from a funding agency. <laughs> but, what he's saying also is that, you know, that, that, that the, the publication of, of, of uh, texts is greatly assisted by the internet. Of oh, course. yeah, that very much the so. The ability of scholars to access these materials is much greater than it's ever been before, which encourages more. Oh yeah, the, the, but that's general improvements in the infrastructure. The fact that you can, there's, I just discovered there's a famous series from, from Mari. There's a famous publication, the publication of all the Mari texts, which is in Akkadian. I just, just discovered they're all online now <laughs> with commentary and updated commentary, you know. So it's quite remarkable, this, even in these small esoteric fields, how much the infrastructure has improved. You don't have to go to a library anymore, <laughs> which is wonderful. That's not completely true. But. So talking about the languages of Mari or Ogmartian, when do you think, what do you think we can do next? Maybe uh, not I mean, next month, whatever you want it. What would be the next oh, language? There's, there's still an audience. Um, I was sort of interested in looking at Ugaritic. I looked at it, studied it 30 years ago, but I haven't looked at it since. And people, will, if people know Hebrew, they'll be very interested, I think, because well, Ugaritic is not that. Canaanite, isn't it? Yeah, it's the, well, it's it's Canaanite. It's ex exact classification is uncertain. That's, it's that's hasn't been resolved. People differ in their opinions on that. But most interesting, from a cultural standpoint, there are phrases you find in the Hebrew Bible and Psalms that are duplicated in Ugaritic. So it's our, our earliest example of a Canaanite religion in, in pre-Hebrew days. And there were clear connections. So it was the first, um, before that, the Bible sort of stood, stood alone. We didn't know anything about its predecessors, you know, what people were thinking religiously. But now we do to some extent. So may, maybe, you, well, let me think about it, Zach. Okay. Um, Sorry, comment yeah. about you know Wayne's comment earlier about um, Abraham of or of the Chaldees that um, got to point out that that the, that the the Chaldees are not attested 
in Mesopotamia until the first millennium. Yeah, yeah, it's a first, and, it's an Aramaic first millennium tribal name and how the, you know, so what it's, word. It's, it's basically impossible that, 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 uh, that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. Yeah. Abraham, you know, would, would have to be dated for hundreds of years before, you know, certainly no, no later than the second millennium. So uh, one could say that Ur of the Chaldees was known to the writers of the Bible, but that has very little to do with any uh, hypothetical individual named Abraham. Yeah, I wasn't going to say it so bluntly, but we don't we don't know where <laughs> Abraham came from. <laughs> was he even real? Uh, there's always that question about you know foundation of fo foundational myth myths. I tend to give traditions the benefit of the doubt, though. There's probably a historical core there that's true, but we'll never know unless we get very lucky. And incidentally, um, I was talking about while I'm talking about Mario. Um, uh, Liverani, let me say that Liverani um, has published some papers in which he, he vehemently attacks the idea of historical kernel. And he says, oh, he, does. That, okay. he says that that's that's that the historical kernel is really the refuge of academics who need to publish and therefore have to have something to write about. But there, but but that it at least he believes that it's methodologically unsound to argue hmm. from, you know, some uh, piece of literature in 700 BC about anything that may have happened in 2000 BC. Yeah. The great that, example that. being the autobiography of Sargon. That's, that's very true. I scholars, agree. Scholars oh. say actually tells us something about Sargon and Liverani says absolutely not. Not a thing. Yeah, it's, it's a all these religions have foundational myths and they're all questionable and yeah. uh, it's but i agree abraham well somehow monotheism got going it's unclear how i mean probably influenced by akhenaten that's the usual claim um yeah i just i just read a uh, interesting book about exodus that claimed uh, that um the uh, what happened the jews uh, were not slaves in Egypt, but they probably were mistreated. But they were there for many hundreds of years, a, a group, and they were heavily Egyptianized. And so what happened for some reason, and, and it was a small group, they, they fled Egypt and went back to the land of Canaan and integrated with the Jews who, who had remained there. And that's where um, they probably brought monotheism with them. Uh, well, it, it, that's a hypothesis I read about a, in, in John Deaver. Yeah, well, the interesting thing, there's so many Egyptian names in Exodus, starting with Moses. It's very yeah. strange. Why do they have Egyptian names? Unless maybe they were Egyptian. Maybe they were Egyptianized Jews. Right, well, Moses, I mean, we people know the names of the great pharaoh Tutmos, who was Tutmosis. So uh, you take Moses and add the prefix Tut. Thot, yeah, it's the same Tut, element. Thoth. I, and so clearly Moses is, uh, you know, the, the, the der derivation that we hear that it meant that he was brought forth from the water is, I think, discredited in academia. Well, that, that's what's called a folk et etymology. It's a, people make up etymologies which aren't right. historically accurate just because of sound similarities. And that, that's universally accepted about that name. So, so Passover, there's another one in the Bible, Passover is derived from pass out god passed over and that's also false john do you know anything about the languages of mitanni or hurian languages or those are the just kind of like enigma at this point? yeah i don't know if i could produce a decent lecture on either of them <laughs> because well, the, the, the the hurian is better known mitanni is the is not a, yeah the, the hurian Mitanni, speakers mitanni Mitanni is a place name. It's not a ling linguistic name. So Hurrian was the language of Mitanni. And uh, frankly, I haven't looked at it in a long time. I don't know how well it's understood. Um, I think Hurrian is maybe another one of these isolates or... or yeah, I believe. Which has very few other... Um, but interestingly, was was written in cuneiform. 
Yes. Well, as Akkadian was, as was Hittite, another very Akkadian cuneiform spread all over the ancient Near East. Um, I always point out it's interesting the Egyptian writing system, even though they were the great power, did not spread. It was Akkadian. But I always assume it's because Akkadian was much more easy to learn and much more suitable um, for uh, every day. I mean, Egyptian hieroglyphs always had a a numinous quality about them for the Egyptians. So it, it didn't spread to other, other cultures like Akkadian did. Right. It's interesting that, you know, we, we do in Europe, we have still languages like Basque or Georgian that are not related to anything, right? I mean, it's, it's just interesting. Well, Georgian, uh, Basque is an isolate. Georgian, there's a large number of ca Caucasian languages that are assumed to be historically linked, and they, they share, share a lot of structural similarities. As, as I said in the talk, they're ergative, um, those languages, but the Caucasus is one of the most complex linguistic areas in the world. You know, people living in little mountain valleys, they develop all sorts of different languages and very strange languages, fascinating languages, so. Yeah. Uh, the hypothesis there is that, you know, when people get driven out of the desirable lowlands and agriculturally fertile lands, they flee to the mountains and then their language manages to survive for a very long period of time because no one wants to conquer them. They don't have anything that yeah. anyone wants. All right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah, sorry. Okay. No, I just read an interesting piece of the tribe in, in South America that has no social organization no large-scale social organization. There's nothing bigger than a family and they, they live alone. And it's thought that the families live alone. It's thought these people are just hiding out from potential uh, invaders and conquerors. They deliberately, you know, left themselves that, you know, they, they have no wealth. There's nothing to steal. It is a strategy. You know, how did the in Inuit, the Eskimos end up where they're living? <laughs> it's interesting how in Caucasus the Muslim religion has has really sunk in, you know, like in areas of Dagestan, Chechnya, and, you know, and not as much, um, except for Georgia and Armenia, not as much as the Christianity, but that's more of a plain areas, maybe Georgia, more of a mountainous areas, but the real Russia caucus, so to speak, it's, you know, I don't know how they were able to convert. Uh, well, the, the Muslim missionaries managed to convert a lot of Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. And they, they had very good missionary activities. They didn't have to conquer a place to, uh, to convert people. True, true, true. But it's interesting that the Hazaria kingdom was right next to Okoka. It's similar to Christianity in, in, the, in the Russian world, right? The, they didn't, the, the Christianity was introduced by Greek uh, Byzantine by Saint Cyril, uh, and there was no conquest of the Rus. Uh, there was just a, an intellectual or spiritual conquest, if you will. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, the Muslim religion has been there for so long, and um, and it held on it pretty pretty well established, in, uh, especially in areas of Dagestan, Chechnya, and all these other areas. Interesting. So yeah, I, I always find it amusing to see those half Islamic, half Russian names, like who's the head of Kazakhstan? Islam Karimov. Islam <laughs> <laughs> Karimov was the former president of Uzbekistan that passed away. So I just want to talk about our upcoming um, for a couple of minutes. John, again, this was amazing. Oh, thank you. Look forward, uh, you know, any ideas you can throw by us, whichever language you want to do. But you have an audience today. I had a, a pick was about 45, 46 people. Oh, good. That's very uh, good. Still have 20 people on, which is amazing. And uh, it's all testament to you. And uh, thanks for Paul adding, you know, incredible. Any point? No, in no I'm pleased. I did. I expected nobody to show up. But this is really nerdy stuff. So <laughs> no, it, it, <laughs> that's what I am. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I appreciate that, um, you know, and uh, so many people have exhibit interest. We have the worldwide audience and that's so the people are interested in this stuff. Yeah, yeah you're right. right. I, I'm interested. So, it, you know, and then a lot of people signed up and unfortunately it's, it's a weekend and that's why only 46 showed up. But next time it will go grow as people would know more of you know, 
your uh, oh yeah there's, there's one point i want to make i'll make it fast is that um one thing i did mention there's no evidence that akkadian or sumerian are in any way archaic that they have the same processes that's why it's sort of pushed on the ergative theme and that may not have gotten much comprehension i hope it did but um those are processes we see in modern languages all the time. That's the big results of this uh, from a linguistic standpoint of those decipherments of those two languages. It, they look a lot like things we can see in modern languages we actually know. In fact, that's a big area in research. If you can't do it in Sumerian very much, but in Akkadian, if you see some weird grammatical phenomenon, you just re look in the literature and look around for a la another language, a modern one that has the same thing or something similar. That's a very productive area, so. Excellent, excellent. So let me just uh, talk about the programs that we have. So tonight at seven, um, our own uh, Jason Peng is gonna talk about Asian philosophy. Uh, so do join us, Buddhist. Do that with no. <laughs> Buddhist. <laughs> Wayne, you can mute yourself, please. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, a Buddhist monk Huan Zhang and early Tang dynasty. Um, that would be today at seven. Uh, on Monday, we have history of Greek and Roman philosophy. And now we're actually moving from classical Greek and we're going to talk about Eleatics and uh, uh, Parmenides, Parmenides. And then uh, on Thursday, uh, next week, we're going to do a formation of Saudi Arabia, which is our Middle Eastern. Um, uh, presentations. So if anybody wants to know how the Saudi Arabia was formed, you know, Richard is going to be able to explain. And then next Sunday, uh, we're going to do a virtual tour of pilgrimage of Mecca, Medina, or they call, in Muslim religion, you call it Hajj. And there's going to be, you know, Narul and Dr. Sabil are going to talk about the significance of it. And they're going to have a lot of videos and pictures to show from their own uh, virtual tour of the Hajj. And uh, just to you know, mention, we have an in-person New York meet on September 21st, 24th. Uh, we're going to go to Guggenheim Museum, and then we're going to finish with Beer House, New York, New York City, and it's posted. And on the 25th, we're going to do Empress Wu, um, which is very, very famous. Empress Wu uh, was, you know, uh, Jane is going to do the presentation as part of our Powerful Women series. So without further ado, uh, we come up on, up to the hour. John, again, thank you again uh, for this amazing presentation. I hope to hear from you again, and then we'll you know do another presentation. And everybody have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you.